On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1969. We're going to be taking a look at Roy Clark, and he's going to be performing Yesterday When I Was Young. <laughs> Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So this performance was on the request list, but it isn't a live performance. I thought it was an important one to look at nonetheless, considering that we've looked at Roy playing guitar, banjo and fiddle, and we've never focused on his vocals. And this is such a great example of that. Another update to add in, unfortunately, the video has been blocked. So I'm going to leave a link in the description below and also pin it to the top of the comments So you guys can click on that and watch the original video that I watched before the analysis and then head back here For the analysis segment and I'll see you guys in the comments section This is one of those songs that is so simplistic from a progression point of view, but there is so much in there with the lyrical content and the way that Roy delivers this is so compelling and engaging and just his voice, he's got that natural delivery, having that vibrato in there as well, just within his sound all the time. But it just goes to show that Roy Clark as a talent, not only playing so many instruments to a top level. By the way, just throwing in here that he was a monster guitar player, and you might have seen videos that I've done on Roy in the past on the channel here somewhere, but if you haven't, just go on YouTube and check out Roy's playing, because he was a top level player, but he was so entertaining and being in the 70s on Hee Haw as well, a show over in the USA, a country show that was very lighthearted. He had the personality in order to present, but also such a wide skill set. And it's something that will fly under the radar of most people who aren't musicians or play an instrument themselves as to the level that Roy was at instrumentally. But then here we can see that he's a top level vocalist as well. When I say that, this is the kind of performance and vocal that if you were to hear this on the radio, you would wonder who this is and you'd want to go and buy this song because it is so well delivered. Roy's got that connective quality to his voice where the lyrics have meaning and there's emotion in there and you can connect to Roy's delivery of this song. It was written by Charles Aznavour in 1964. So it wasn't Roy's song, but you wouldn't have known that the way that he sings it. The other thing is, to give you an idea of the level that Roy was at vocally, loads of artists have covered this in the past, but it's Roy's version that is known the most. And some of those artists are Ghislaine Campbell, who released a version in 1974, Shirley Bassey, Dusty Springfield, Bing Crosby, Andy Williams. So some big names have released their own version of Yesterday When I Was Young. But you can certainly see the level of artistic credibility that Roy Clark had from a vocal perspective, as well as being just an all-round talented musician. So looking at this from an analytical perspective, we've got the spoken word from Roy when the track starts out just telling the story of the song before he gets into his singing. And there is a lot of reverb on that intro of the song. And the difference between reverb and echo is something that's popped up in the comments section recently. And reverb is the acoustic space, the acoustic environment in which the singer is singing. So you'll hear the space. For example, imagine singing in an arena or in a cave, you'll hear the vastness of space that is included in that environment, whereas an echo is a repeat of the thing that you've heard. In nature, it'll be like singing or shouting at a wall that is a long way away, and by the time the sound waves have gone there, hit the wall and come back, you'll hear what you said, but delayed by a few milliseconds or longer than that, depending on how far away that wall is and how well the sound travels. Just to give an example, I'll put the effect on in the edit. Reverb. Echo. Echo. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more of an idea. Something that I want to put under the spotlight with Roy's vocal in this song 
is the way that he's got control of that vibrato. It's not really wide. It's not too over the top, even though it's definitely wider than you would normally hear in mainstream pop because this is one of those performances where the vibrato has to be controlled and slow in frequency because it is a ballad. You don't want a really excitable sounding vibrato when you're singing a ballad such as this and Roy absolutely nails it. The other thing is the way that Roy at the end of vocal phrases sometimes decreases his pitch with vibrato and it's something that I have cued the video to here so that you guys can maybe hear it. I'm not sure whether you'll spot it. I have slowed it down to half speed so it'll be a little bit more exaggerated and hopefully you guys can hear it at the end of that line where the pitch decreases. Let's have a listen. As if it were a foolish game. There we go. So we have this as if it was a foolish game. And it goes, game. There's a definite decrease in pitch. And you can listen out for this throughout the whole performance because Roy throws it in there the whole time. And sometimes he does finish with a straight note. But by decreasing the pitch at the end of the vocal phrase, it means that it sounds almost like disappointment. Like when you've been let down, you go, oh. There's a decrease in pitch naturally in your voice when you're expressing disappointment or regret. All of the emotions that this song just convey with Roy's performance of it and his delivery of it. And a lot of that is because of this decrease in pitch that he goes through at the end of vocal phrases. This isn't something that Roy would be doing consciously and decreasing the pitch by a set amount. It's just the way that he's feeling when he's performing this song, he's naturally just decreasing the pitch of his voice at the end of the phrase. If you imagine doing the opposite, and I went as if it was a foolish game, and I went up, that wouldn't make sense on any level emotionally to do with the song because it's almost making a question out of that vocal phrase because that's what happens in language when you're asking a question. You might go up at the end of your sentence, and even though I'm not asking a question there, it sounds like a question, even when it's not a question. And some people talk like that. They always sound like they're asking a question when actually they're not, they're just talking like this. But because they're going up at the end, that's what registers in our brains as asking a question. So you don't wanna do that with your vocal phrases when you're singing, but then decreasing the pitch is sounding disappointed going down at the end is always going to sound like I've been let down a little bit and I'm a little bit sad because I'm going down at the end of every sentence. Obviously, when you start laughing, it's not going to have the same effect, but you can start to hear how language and music are just totally intertwined with each other. The emotions that you feel when you're talking to somebody and they're telling you a story that is emotional, it's the same with singing. You'll find all of these tiny little details in conversation, but in the great singers, because they can tap into the conversational quality of language within music. He's not singing this out of range, it's within his talking range. And this is the thing that we all talk in notes, it's just that we don't notice it. So then when a singer starts to sing within that conversational space, then it starts to connect even more because he's not reaching for notes and we're not thinking about Roy reaching notes and not quite hitting them here. We're just listening to that lyrical content because it's comfortable for him to sing and it's in his conversational space where he would normally be talking. So just getting into the guitar chords very quickly, we've got the G minor into a C, which you can play down there, into the F, into a B flat, then we go to a G minor again, I think, into an A7, into a D minor, and that's it, and then just repeat that cycle again. Now, when we get to the G minor that second time round, there are a couple of things that you can do. We do have a lot of strings in here as well. So you could play from the B flat. You could play the 
minor seventh there, the G minor seventh if you want to. Something that I like the sound of, especially with the vocal melody over the top, is playing the B flat into the G minor sixth shape. Then into that A seventh. I just really like the sound of that with the vocal over the top. Something I want to address quickly as well is the lead guitar solo because it is really melodic and it just borrows the melody from the vocal lines. And this is a great tool to use if you're just starting to play lead guitar solos and you're struggling for ideas. If the song does have a vocal melody to it, just copy those notes and then throw in a few techniques and just change it up a little bit, but keep the melody in there by taking the melody from that lead vocal. So in this case, we're in D minor. So it means that we're gonna be starting on our 10th fret to get into pentatonic shape one, which is gonna sound like that. And just a quick tip here, if you're looking to find notes of a vocal melody in a particular key, they are pretty much always going to fall within the same shapes or the same fingering that you've got on the left hand in pentatonic shape one. So if I'm starting on the high E string with my little finger, going down to the first finger, on the high E string and the B string, and then go down to the G string with the third finger and the first finger. If you keep that fingering strict, it means that if I go and place down my third finger after my little finger on the high E string, you wanna always do that. So if you're just looking to find melodies, then play the little finger, second finger, first finger. Always do that on the B string. So far we've got like that. And then take the third finger, the first finger down one fret, just slide down. And now you're playing the octave of that extra note that we threw in on the high E string. So all together. So now you've covered an octave worth of notes there that are used all the time. So if you keep that fingering strict all the time, you'll start finding melodies really easily. You just have to experiment with it. And this goes for both major and minor keys, by the way. You wanna play exactly the same notes and the same finger formations when you're playing in the major key and major pentatonic shape one, as well as minor pentatonic shape one. It's just the same shape in a different place. So it means that if I start, There is, in this solo, a little movement down to when we get to the A seventh chord. It's just a little shift down like that. But for the most part, all of the other notes are gonna be within this. And this is where just throwing in stylizations works. Like there, I'm still in pentatonic shape one, but I slid into that after going down to like that. So it sounds fancy, but I'm not doing anything fancy at all. So once you've got those notes and you remember them, you'll be able to find loads of melodies on your guitar and something that's in, D minor, when you're in this minor pentatonic shape. You'll find that just playing those extra notes adds so much to the sound of your lead work and going all the way up. It's just gonna give another dimension to your playing rather than just going. And getting stuck in pentatonic shape one the whole time is so good. Being able to throw in an extra note or two, but it's all the same muscle memory.
Another thing to mention is that if you are playing a lead guitar solo in a ballad, you generally don't want to throw in loads of technique and loads of notes per second. Just one or two will do. It's all about the sound of the notes, not how many you can fit into a bar at any one time. So just make sure that you can get a nice sound from a single note with vibrato, get that note to sing, and then once you start playing those extra notes that I've just demonstrated, if you can get each of those to sing, it will give you so many options. But it's great to have a look back at Roy with his vocals under the spotlight, considering his instrumental ability, but also having this vocal ability as well. Thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!